macro evolution so what is macro evolution in contrast from micro evolution so as you know evolution is change in allele frequencies in a population over time isn't it so that is uh, basically the, the classical definition of uh, you know molecular evolution or just normal evolution or micro evolution so the evolution that is happening inside be, below the species level is called micro evolution so now macro evolution is at a larger scale uh, usually last for millions of years isn't it so above species level obviously you know and also it it concerns matters like uh, fossils or uh, how the species is forming that is called speciation events all those things you know lineage split or cladogenesis all these terms are involved in macro evolution you know so usually this term is used in context with the morphology and especially in paleontology and uh, a formal definition is above the species level that means genera, you know, genus, the plural is genera, isn't it? And family level, order, class, uh, kingdom, all these things are part of the macro evolution. While micro evolution is below the species level, at or below the species level, like the distribution patterns of the species or population genetics, you know, uh, how the populations of the same species at different geographical locations evolve. So those are some of the key questions in microevolution. while this is macroevolution is a little bit uh, bigger. So this particular topic, let's first talk a little bit about uh, some of the key concepts. So it's more like a review of uh, various concepts that we oftentimes used in evolutionary biology. So the first is a little bit historical on orthogenesis and mutationism. What are these concepts? Orthogenesis is, I mean, it's predating the Darwin, you know, it's very old concept. So this is a straight line evolution like uh, you can see in this diagram, you know, so it is something like a bacteria. So the le least complex to the most complex or advanced, you know, creatures. So they are actually evolving. So bacteria is turning into, let us say fish, that fish is turning into reptile, you know, see, <laughs> that looks so fallacious, isn't it? Of course it is fallacious, but there used to be this kind of concept, orthogenesis, that is straight line evolution. So variation is directed towards fixed goals in predetermined direction and natural selection doesn't exist. So you know that um, relics of this orthogenesis is even found in today's book, even the, the textbook titles like uh, higher plants, taxonomy of lower plants, so lower and higher that implies this orthogenesis which is incorrect. You know, so there is nothing called lower plants or higher plants. Higher means what? More complex. Lower means less complex, which is incorrect to use it that way. Because the least complex, like let us say mycobacterium, you know, very, very simple uh, bacteria. Or a very complex, for example, Astraceae, the plant. All are equidistant from the root of tree of life. So, you know, it, everything has been changed. So, it, it you know, it is kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, whatever the complex that we see in our real life, like for example, human being, we have a higher sense of consciousness. We are a much above the other plants and animals. So th those are kind of like, you know, that is uh, incorrect. In, in one sense, it is basically if you really think deeply about it. So, you know, it is it has something to do with our own linguistic abilities. We cannot actually, uh, you know, compare the other people. We don't even know that. Does the consciousness do exist in other animals? You know, unless you can interpret how do they speak, right? So, yes, yeah, so this is orthogenesis. Now, mutationism is a term, uh, especially by Morgan and Hugo Devries. Both of them did extensive work on uh, genetics, especially on uh, Drosophila melanogaster. According to them, the variations supplied by the mutation is the only reason new, new phenotypes are coming up. You know, so the, the term mutationism is against the natural selection selection doesn't play drift doesn't play just mutation that is the reason for new new phenotype which is again that is a, a wrong concept both of these are wrong concept isn't it so mutation alone is not the driving force for the speciation but speciation do have several mechanisms isn't it there is another term called atavism what is that atavism is that the, the traits that have a tendency to revert back to the ancestral type like for example, if you, uh, you know, your great grandfather had certain trait that you also have it. So it's kind of a reversal, you know, back mutation, isn't it? So that is uh, the term atavism is from the Latin atavus, 
that means a great 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 grandfather so four generations above so the, the name is called atavas so again uh, atavism is the reason why we have vestigial structures like darwin's tubercle on the ear if you closely inspect most of us have that small projection in the pinna you know the external part of the human ear is called pinna right so this pinna has got this small section so if you look at here this uh, if you look through uh, you know our close uh, relatives right uh, different animals like uh, the primates most of this uh, monkeys do have it the ears too so this projected part is called tubercle so darwin in his uh, descent of man he has written about this particular organ as a vestigial structure we have already covered this vestigiality isn't it human vestigiality so vestigial structures are rudimentary traits or organs uh, you know that are homologous uh, to the fully functional traits in related animals that is what this vestigial structures are all about uh, one example is tail bone coccyx you know so that is a relics of our uh, ancestry with those animals that had real tail you know or hip bone for uh, you know so uh, uh, for uh, for example dolphin or whale you know so blue whale or orcas if you look at the those or uh, animals which are actually dolphins and whales are mammal you know so you you can see still you can see their hip bone why do they need a hip bone right if they don't know how to walk if they simply swim because of this vestigiality or atavism you know so fitness we have already covered that there are two kinds of fitness so fitness as it is is the success of an organism in the environment so which allows it to spread its genes to the next generation so fitness allow the organism to contribute into the uh, next generation that is what the fitness is about right so the two kinds of fitness uh, you know absolute and relative so absolute means number of offsprings the individual makes if you have two children then you, your absolute fitness is two if you have only one child uh, your absolute fitness is one as simple as that so it is also known as fecundity number of offspring a person has now relative fitness means absolute fitness upon the average fitness of that species in concern for example if the human being uh, you know uh, in the globe level average human has 1.5 offspring then average fitness of human population is 1.5 you know so that is what so if you put absolute fitness upon average fitness that is called relative fitness for example here uh, the dolphin uh, population uh, individual this individual had four offspring while the population average of this dolphin is three three offspring on average all the dolphins in the world has so then you simply divide these two number 4 by 3 1.33 is the relative fitness of that particular individual in the population i hope it's clear to you hardy weinberg principle which we already covered so this is like a null hypothesis of the evolution so the uh, you know it's it's very simple p square plus 2 pq plus q square is 1 provided there is no uh, you know there is no mechanisms of evolutionary change like there's no selection no drift no migration no assortative mating all those things right so that is the hardy weinberg principle means that the genotypes uh, remains constant unless they are disturbed by the natural selection or other such mechanisms of the evolutionary change you know exaptation is a term coined out by the charles darwin and what is that it's uh, there are a lot of other terms synonyms for this acceptation uh, co-option or pre-adaptation or serial homology so basically it, this means a shift in the function of the trait so the same trait or an organ the function keep on changing one example would be feather original function of the bird's feather had been to provide the warmth you know so there is the same thing you can see the fur right to provide the warmth for the organ or uh, the, the organism Changed function is to display. Display means to get the uh, sexual mates, sexual display, you know, for mate uh, hunting, isn't it? So you can still see that display as a function in uh, peacock, isn't it? Uh, they are displaying it, they're dancing it with the feather for the mate. Further changed for flight, 
you know so the 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 function keep on changing that is called serial homology or acceptation so this is the reason why we have complex organs like human eye so slowly slowly it's changing the function keep on changing you know lungs of many basal fish which evolved into the lungs of terrestrial vertebrate but it also underwent acceptation to become the gas bladder a bnc control organ in derived fish something like uh, scuba you know uh, that uh, bnc control uh, cylinders of course that is also providing the air to breathe isn't it so yes yeah, so that that uh, uh, you know the, the the bladder the lungs changing into the bnc control so that is another uh, reason for uh, another example of this acceptation you know so what is the term sexual cannibalism cannibalism is eating someone right sexual cannibalism is that after mate uh, you know the one you are mating with the per <laughs> that individual is eating you there is kind of an altruism you know so altruism is uh, you're self sacrificing for uh, some bigger cause you know some other purpose isn't it so this is very common the sexual cannibalism is very common in spider or praying mantis as you can see here praying mantis so males get eaten upon the copulation by the female so once the male copulate with the female they mate they have sex and just after that the female eat the male because the whole purpose of the male's life is transmit its sperm to the female and after that the purpose is solved then what is the point of his life so it's better that his entire body becomes food of the female you know it's very strange isn't it so it's common in many of the you social animals so you social animals like ants and spiders and all those you know insects you can see uh, this kind of thing so well how about our own lives what is the, the purpose of our life so there is a term called replicator that individuals our whole purpose of human life is function as a replicator missionary to transmit our genes to the next generation so that is what the fitness is about uh, offspring that you make so if you do not produce any offspring you are as good as dead in the classical darwinian uh, fitness interpretation you know so yeah that is the that is why the genes are often called selfish genes so we are simply as a as a mechanism an elaborative display just to find a mate and transmit the genes to the next generation that is uh, you know that is one way to interpret the darwinism and you can see that in dawkins book richard dawkins all these uh, famous book that he wrote you know uh, and also i can uh, suggest two other books of the dawkins it is basically uh, this is the book the, the greatest show on earth a very very good book i can also uh, you know this is i or it's already displayed there blind watchmaker and also the god delusion the god delusion very very fantastic book all these are popular science books you know so uh, you can have a look all this book is is a prolific writer it's a british evolutionary biologist uh, richard dawkins he's uh, he's living uh, you know one of the greatest living evolutionary biologist right and there is there is another concept in evolution biology called grandmother hypothesis what is that so the idea is that uh, as i told you about replicator the, the sole purpose of human life is to find a mate and reproduce right and in, if if you think that way then why do we live past the reproductive age that is a question here so if the sole purpose is just to find mate how why why the grandmoms are living you know even though she is uh, not fertile post menopause so why human beings do live so we are actually an exceptional species most of the species post reproductive age they die you know like for example our own closest relative is chimpanzee they live mostly 30 years and po post 30 years and they are quite lethargic also you know they they don't walk much like human beings uh, they walk only 2 2 kilometers per day in the wild you know and uh, they they die quite young you know after uh, uh, re achieving the reproductive age they usually die but we live lo longer just like orca that is another exception orcas are killer whales it it also lives quite long so the hypothesis is that post menopause why menopause then women why we are talking more about women here in the grandmother why not grandfather because you know that uh, uh, the men usually they don't actually uh, lose their fertility even if they become really old 
you know so there is the, there is yet another factor as well you know it's about the erection isn't it so other than that sperms are still alive isn't it so it is uh, you know technically speaking uh, the male are not losing the fertility even if they become really old but females the case is different because there is menopause is real in post menopause the, the females are not productive so that is why the theory is called a grandmother so the idea of this grandmother hypothesis is that uh, after menopause the women redirect the efforts for the survival of her offspring and their offspring you know so that is what like this grandmother uh, she is putting all her effort for uh, you know for the survival of her offspring and then the second generation even third generation right they can actually put a lot of energy and through which she is contributing to uh, whatever the genes that she is sharing half of the genes is shared with her own offspring and one quarter with her uh, you know great uh, the granddaughters and grand uh, child you know grandson so she is contributing on the saving of those genes you know share in the shared gene pool so uh, such thing even if she is not reproducing it is called indirect reproduction you know so you know, because she is contributing for the survival of such genes in the population isn't it grandmother hypothesis there is a very interesting paper published just now two days ago and that is just accepted you know it is uh, to be released in december 14th uh, you know uh, 14th issue of the pnas proceedings of national academy of sciences it's called the active grandfather grandparent hypothesis physical activity and evolution of extended human uh, health spans and life spans so uh, yes yeah, so this article argues that the reason why we live really long uh, you know decades past our reproductive maturity is because we are really active in our life so exercise can beat aging that is what this uh, this paper is all about you know check it out right that is uh, the same case with orcas as well why orcas live really long and uh, that is the indirect reproduction the, there is another term for it is called inclusive fitness so inclusive fitness is basically you can think of this kind of squirrel you know so this sort of squirrel this is known as belding's ground squirrel so this squirrel gives a alarm call when attacked by a predator to warn its local group so uh, a bird of prey uh, you know so when that bird like an eagle attacks it uh, this squirrel individual start crying you know very loud alarm call through which it's getting all the attention from the uh, predator you know and uh, uh, through which he or she is self sacrificing but by that self sacrifice uh, you know that animal is saving hundreds of other squirrels in the vicinity you know see that is called self sacrificial right uh, uh, behavior that is called altruistic behavior so why such behavior is selected in the population so because of this inclusive fitness you know so that is the idea this is uh, of course is about uh, altruism the idea is that uh, by uh, you know if this person this individual is not crying then uh, many others are also under danger so just because it's crying and self sacrificing of course it's killing right it's a suicidal uh, behavior uh, but uh, this individual is saving hundreds of other squirrel with whom uh, this squirrel is sharing the gene pool with so uh, ultimately whatever the genes that uh, this squirrel is shared with other uh, uh, you know members of its family and relatives so that genes are being survived you know so this kind of behavior happens among the close relative that is called kin you know so the term this particular concept is coined out by w d hamilton in 1964 pretty old concept but still very very popular you know so it's about indirect reproduction so this explains uh, what is the point if even if you don't marry or if you don't have any children why you want to live so you can always say that okay Uh, the purpose of my life is to pro to protect you know uh, uh, to give comfort to my sister's children or my brother's children you know so that way there is a yet another meaning of that life even if you don't have any children or 
even if you are uh, you know uh, unfortunately you are infertile so that indirect reproduction makes sense so there comes the the uh, another uh, you know concept called kin selection so it's a evolutionary strategy that flavors that favors the reproductive success of the organism's kin kin means relative so that is what the the inclusive fitness is all about right like squirrel right the the relatives you are supporting something like nepotism isn't it it's kind of corruption but it's highly biological you know kin selection you are doing some self sacrifice for your relatives in the population you know even at a cost to the organism's own survival and reproduction even if the organism itself is uh, you know uh, uh, getting eaten by its prey <laughs> that is that happens right so kin selection is part of the natural selection it's a, it's a kind of a natural selection so selection normally favors gene Uh, if it increases in reproduction, so the gene or allele should the frequency should increase, isn't it? That is what uh, the evolution is being, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the the def definition of the the very evolution itself is increase in in uh, uh, you know allele frequency in a population, isn't it? Be, uh, but because the offspring share the copy of the gene, so if all, all offsprings do share the copy of the gene, it increases in frequency, right? but the gene can also be favored if it aids other relatives who also share the copies you know like your sister or brother do have many of your own genes right so even if you support them to achieve their reproductive age and successfully pass on their genes to their offspring you are indirectly contributing to those genes in question you know very interesting concept isn't it yes so uh, you can read more about this kin selection in this article which i cited here and uh, yes yeah, so altruism is favored when hamilton's rule is satisfied the rule is r b minus c should be more than zero so it's all about cost benefit analysis isn't it so c is a fitness cost so basically this is a cost to the altruist whatever the cost like suicide is actually his life is gone right whatever the genes complete gene is gone so that is a cost of his uh, this particular behavior but b is a fitness benefit to the individual helped you know so the genetic relatedness is need to be factored in so you are multiplying with the relatedness so close knit community and every you are saving life of your relatives then this behavior is especially the suicidal behavior the altruistic behavior and kin selection will be favored but if you are saving the lives of utter strangers then there is no point in saving that kind of thing isn't it evolutionally speaking okay so in that case this is not zero you know so this should be more than zero if it's positive then kin selection is favored if it's negative then kin selection is not favored so it all depends on which behavior it is you know and that comes to the question of uh, it's one of the very famous thought experiment in ethics called trolley problem uh, originally devised by philippa foote the american uh, you know ethicist philosopher in 1967 so think of a road uh, you know a railroad that is basically the railway tracks and uh, a trolley or a bogey you know a compartment is slowly running down the rail rod okay so it is from an elevation like let us say it is actually a mountain top it's going down and you are standing here so you you are seeing that there are five men sleeping on the track and there is another man sleeping on the track here and you are right at the junction you know so what will you do you have a control you cannot stop the trolley impossible to stop stop the trolley you know only thing you can do is that either you can with this pulley if you pull it this uh, this lever towards you then this trolley will pass on to this direction and if you push this uh, you know lever to that direction away from you then uh, you know this uh, uh, mechanism will make it to for this trolley to pass on to this direction what will you do that is a, the idea is that uh, will you kill uh, five persons or uh, for saving one or let us say this person is a child and all five are adults what will you do you know so will you uh, let the trolley pass on to five adults or will you let the the trolley pass on to one child so it's up to you to take a decision you cannot say that okay i will do nothing 
again you you are responsible then isn't it uh, like executioner in uh, in you know in the in the uh, capital punishment the hangman isn't it so the hangman is not responsible uh, who is actually responsible is it the judge who put the death imprisonment or the crime committed by that person so ultimately that all uh, you know questions point to the initial crime isn't it so yeah so what will you do here if i ask you will you save the child for, for five adults think of it or if i reword this statement uh, these five are some other countrymen let us say pakistanis and this one is an indian indian and pakistanis will you kill five pakistanis for the for saving one indian or vice versa think about it you know so maybe you will say okay because i i i care, care more about humanity rather than nationalism i will choose this okay then let me reword this okay this person is your father and these five are complete strangers <laughs> ask yourself what will you do will you kill your father to save five strangers or you know so or will you actually kill your father for saving the five or will you kill the five strangers to kill your own father or your own mother or if you have offspring your own children a child think of it you cannot lie yourself so that is the problem so ultimately the question comes on shared gene pool so if this person has shared gene pool with you you know like your own parents or your own offspring chances are high that you will do everything to save the person you know even at the cost of utter strangers even hundreds of strangers that is what the evolutionary theory is all about you know so the game theory is uh, these are the, the cost and benefit analysis or trade offs so you know which one to go with uh, you know given multiple trade then that comes the mathematical theory called game theory so it is coming from as as you can see the game so it's all about zero sum game you need to take something and that action has got you know uh, repercussions so that is what the game theory is all about so it deals with optimal strategies to win the game for example this game here a rock scissors and paper very common in japan where i was there so it is like you know you you are uh, uh, i i'm sure you you played this game right otherwise you please check it out in the youtube uh, you know so whatever the decision you are taking there are three ways that you take the decision right either scissors or rock or a paper so it all depends on what your opponent takes what kind of decisions do they take so to win this game the idea is that to cooperate or not cooperate in that group so that is the idea now so should we cooperate with others in the group or should we compete with others in the group so if we cooperate what are the benefits and if we compete what are the advantage for us so all these are the questions that are com coming in the mathematical uh, you know uh, concept of the game theory you know so the advantages if we cooperate and disadvantage if we left out so that comes to a very interesting another thought experiment called prisoner's dilemma again in uh, you know in uh, in uh, uh, philosophy right so what is prisoner's dilemma you can think of uh, uh, two prisoner you and uh, one guy you know so you both are you know criminal let us say uh, right so and then uh, you, you both were being questioned by the police officer in two different rooms right so if you confess the crime that you did it you know so you are going to get uh, you know if you if you confess that you you did the crime you are going to get 8 years but your other accomplice your other friend will get only one year right and vice versa also if this person this is prisoner a and this is prisoner b let us say prisoner a is you prisoner b is the other person right so if you confess then prisoner a gets one year you get only one year but the other gets 8 years and vice versa other room you never know right what is, what is the other guy going to confess a gay or a girl you know confess or not you never have any clue so should you confess or not another option is that remaining silent if 
you both remain silent, you both are going to get only two years. And if you both confess, you know, that uh, I did that crime, then what is going to get is that both are going to get five years imprisonment, you know. So if both of the prisoners are confessing, each one will be getting five years. If one is confessing, uh, you know, that the one who confessed gets only one year, but the other gets eight years, but it's there is vice versa also. So that is why you never know that what other person is doing. So the most optimal solution for this problem is remain silent, you know. So again, that depends on the kind of uh, the, the punishment. So if both of you remain silent, you both will get only two years, but nobody do it, does it? Reason is that you never know that what is happening in the other room where your friend is going to confess a crime or not, isn't it? So that is that is a part of the classical, uh, you know, uh, problem for the game theory. So this game theory is of a lot of use in evolution, evolutionary game theory. So John Maynard Smith uh, is the one who is responsible, I mean, who did a lot of contribution to the evolutionary game theory. So it's the application of the game theory to the evolutionary biology on strategies of the altruism. So altruism is favored or not. It's all about cooperation versus competition, you know. So altruism needs a lot of cooperation with others. So are you actually willing to self-sacrifice for saving others, you know. So altruism has also connotation with the EU sociality and even now, you know, even terrorism. People are ready to die, you know, uh, suicidal attacks, right. Die for saving their ideology be it politics or be it religion, right, or emotional, whatever, the ideologically charged dialogues. So people are ready for that. They're ready to kill themselves for, uh, you know, for the, the higher purpose of their ideology. But are these actually evolutionarily explained? Unless there is a shared gene pool, this is not explained. But of course, in religion, or in caste, yes, most of the marriages are happening inside that caste or religion, isn't it? So there is definitely shared gene pool also. So there is yet another dimension to think about it, you know. So all these things can have evolutionary explanations too. So evolutionary game theory is all about compromises and trade-offs in adaptations, you know. Uh, there is another term called material compensation, though pretty old term, but is quite often used in textbooks. You can see it. So the term is about in order to spend on one side, nature forced to economize on the other side. So it is a zero sum game, you know. So if you are putting lots of effort on one side, for example, Olympian, uh, Olympic athletes, you know, so they need a lean and mean, you know, vasculature, right? And the skeletal body, right? They need to run faster. So if they are really fatty, they cannot run faster. So they really need lean muscles uh, you know, but if if you go for that really lean, then the problem is that there is a higher chance of, uh, you know, injuries. You know, you, you might get uh, uh, fracture, bone fractures. Yes, that is the case. Most of the uh, Olymp Olympic athletics uh, people do get fractures, you know. So there is a zero-sum game here. Also, if you think about plants in a, in a canopy in the forest, you know, so if the plants needs to compete with other plants in the vicinity for capturing maximum sunlight, you know, so, so uh, the plants needs to grow really tall, right? Then why not all plants are growing that tall? The reason is simple, that, uh, you know, the, there is actually a cost in it, right? You need great vasculature like xylem and phloem, really strong lignin. So you're putting lots of energy in it. And also that you need to pump the water all that height, let us say 100 meters tall, you know. So it takes a lot of effort, but there is actually benefit as well. So it all depends on the various strategies and compromises, you know. Uh, that is what the material compensation is all about. Another related concept is, uh, you know, arms race, evolutionary arms race. Uh, I've already explained that it's about predators and prey. You know, so as predators get faster and faster, so as the prey. And as prey, uh, you know, uh, for example, a deer, you know, deers gets faster and faster. Uh, you know, the predators like lion and uh, tiger needs to, uh, gets faster in order to hunt them, right? So that race is going on as dictated by the game theory, you know, it's very interesting, isn't it? 
so as the the snake venom also it's getting stronger and it's uh you know uh, uh yes so that all these things are you can actually see it in the uh you know the the arms race snakes are uh, you know they're the the venoms what they are doing it, usually in the same species that venom is not uh, effective you know it cannot actually kill members of that same species it needs to be different species and also uh, you know uh, many uh, pre uh, predators of the snake species have evolved biochemical mechanisms uh, to be uh, you know to be avoidant of the, the snake venom they, they their immune system has mechanisms to cope with the the snake bites you know so that is again that is a uh, there is an uh, that is about the arms race and coevolution is this is exactly this is coevolution and coevolution is about the mirror trees you know so the way that evolution happens in one uh, uh, you know one species or one uh, group of organism similar way or if you look at the tree the, the phylogenetic tree will be quite similar to the other side as well you know so for example uh, host and uh, pollinator plant and plant pollinator for example fig species fig trees and wasp pollinators of the fig fig wasps you know so how the fig wasps are evolving if you construct a tree and if you construct a tree of the figs you will see that it's some exactly like a mirror image you know both trees are quite similar because that is how the, the evolution is happening so this is co-evolution you know evolution is simply uh, the other side as well then group selection is yet another very interesting term here so here here the selection is acting on the whole groups of organisms not just individuals of one species you know so that that groups are favoring some groups over the others leading to the evolution of the traits that are group advantageous you know so that is very interesting isn't it so it is something like kin selection but here Kin selection is, as, as I told you, kin selection, kin, the relative means there is a gene pool, there is a shared gene pool. But for the group selection, there is no such shared gene pool, you know. So it is strangers in the same group, you are actually doing the, something like altruism to uh, to save the strangers. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting, right? If, if I, for example, you, you, you know, you are living some, you know, students are living in the hostel. So there is an inter-hostel competition you know it shouldn't be but still hostel a and b and c right and then you are actually fighting for the spirit of your hostel you know like in sports matches you are supporting all of your hostel areas. though the students who are uh, living in that particular hostel doesn't have the shared gene pool isn't it so that is called group selection then the if the natural selection favoring certain groups over others then the group selection comes in picture you know it's a strangers in the group you are simply uh, working for the strangers so in one sense uh, ideology is all about the strangers isn't it especially with political lineage you know so if you uh, if you are actually for one political party then uh, you know you are actually favoring that political party even if you don't have any uh, shared gene pool if you are favoring you know, of course that is, these are all corruption right but if you're doing that kind of practice then that is an, another example of the group selection even if you don't have any shared gene pool or religion you know religion and politics are uh, uh, you know that is basically that influence many of our decision making you know so group selection is a highly controversial uh, topic in evolutionary biology and uh, eo wilson called it multi level selection that is yet another synonym for the group selection uh, one example is uh, the green bird effect <laughs> green bird effect is the uh, you know when an allele causes individuals carrying it uh, you know to both so uh, what is that an allele for example an allele that causes uh, this kind of uh, beard which is green <laughs> you know so of course uh, it is a thought experiment there is nothing like that it's just this guy just uh, dyed the beard with the, the green dye isn't it so it's a thought experiment you know so this thought experiment is uh, in the selfish gene if you read that book of uh, Richard Dawkins it is there in it so uh, let us say that there is an allele that causes the individuals carrying this particular allele to both two things recognize and be recognized by others carrying the same gene so of course if it is a green beard so this guy knows who are the other persons having that same green beard right and then second behave altruistically to those having the allele so this guy is going to behave uh, to protect others having the green beard you know so that kind of effort 
effect is called green bear effect of course that is a group selection is an example isn't it so it's uh, originally conceived by wd hamilton william d hamilton evolutionary biologist in a thought experiment so again it's all about uh, uh, you know uh, trade offs isn't it so if uh, you are the the many things of this green bird effect well, one example is that facultative helping you are helping the others with the, the same kind of bear then your obligate helping so uh, you know you are basically helping to both you know you uh, have that uh, uh, bear or not having you are simply obligately you are helping both now facultatively harming means you are basically harming those without that bear <laughs> you, you know that they are out group people in group is the one with the the green bear isn't it so you you are facultatively harming this is something like the facultatively helping those with the green bear this is facultatively harming so in the case the d is basically obligate harming you are simply harming both the individuals you know so that is the green bear effect is all about now the bear so again that has come recently in the news about um, uh, you know, it's a uh, ignoble price. This year's ignoble price. I featured that in the curiosity of the, the this month's episode of curiosity. That is December episode. Check it out. So one of the uh, award in uh, you know this year's uh, ignoble price is for peace. Uh, that went for a guy called Ethan Beseris and his quarters. And what they did, he did uh, the research on the beard. Why did human being have this beard? <laughs> Very interesting, right? So if you read the Charles Darwin's book, you will see that he has written so many interesting things about the beard. It's something like lion's mane. You know, he compared that the human's beard is like the mane of the lion. You know, so it is like a, a homo homologous trait. But according to him, this the hair has evolved to absorb the punch on the jaw. That is why only males have this, uh, you know, uh, the this beard. And uh, they, they did a lot of work and lots of interesting paper in a high impact journals. Check it out, right? That story. So, yes, yeah, so that is very interesting theory in evolution biology. These are all adaptative, adaptationist, right? Uh, syndrome of the Darwin's legacies. And that people are trying to find what would be the reason, what would be the purpose of various structures of human body. For example, it's bad, you know. So very interesting, please check it out. And also there is a yet another term called evo divo, that is evolutionary and developmental biology combined. Uh, because if you look the way that we develop in the womb, first few days, we are quite similar to the way that the fish develops. And first few months, we are very similar to other primates. So that parallelism is known as evo divo concept. So the reason is that the several genes that contribute in developmental biology which are shared in uh, you know in the uh, uh, ancestral relationships you know deep in phylogeny for example hox gene uh, hox gene is involved in bilateral symmetry and are common across uh, you know many of the vertebrates so that is the reason that when this hox genes start expressing early on in our own developmental uh, you know, uh, our own embryological development, we share the same thing with other animals having the same Hox genes, you know. So that is why evolutionary and developmental biology are quite similar. Uh, but the predictive power, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you start arguing that, uh, look, this is how that uh, the developmental biology says, so therefore evolution should be so and so, that is wrong, you know. But there is a lot of parallelism between evolution and developmental biology. That is exactly is what you call recapitulation theory. Phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. Ontogeny, you know, ontogeny is basically the embryological development. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, right? So that means uh, the the developmental biology or embryological development informs us about the evolutionary legacy. You know, so that is the recapitulation theory of Ernest Haeckel, right? And uh, phylogeography is another very interesting topic in evolutionary biology. It's about, uh, you know, historical processes that may be responsible for the past to present geographic distributions of genealogical lineages. So basically it's about uh, within population and within species, you know, not about the various species, okay. So let us say this, this particular diagram is about the Australian Aboriginal 
uh, you know, uh, Australians, the, those people who are not really white, who later on settled in the Australia. But Aboriginal uh, Australians, these are indo indigenous uh, community, the tribes people, right? So if you look at the, the tribes people's, uh, you know, the haplotypes, you know, the mitochondrial, the mitogenomes of 50, you know, the Aboriginal Australians, you and you consider the tree, you will see that many of these clades are located at close proximity, geographically close proximity. Look at here. These are different, different haplotypes, you know, located at, you know, for example, this clade, this end here, while this clade is more on the north side and central side, isn't it? So that is what the geography and uh, genetics are quite related here. Because, you know, the, the, the term there is a vicarians, right? So vicarians is the speciation in response to geographical barrier. So phylogeography is a sub-discipline that addresses all these things, especially about the dispersion and vicarians. Vicarians is splitting, isn't it? And vicarians is the, the dispersal. Vicarians is the uh, splitting because of the geographical barrier. Dispersal is like human being is dispersal from... Africa to all other places, right? So all the seed dispersal. So these two are really interesting uh, two way to see the same pattern. So uh, usually in phylogeography, we are looking to see that which is right. Is it dispersal or is it because of the vicarians, right? Dispersal means range expansion and speciation uh, that can lead. The dispersal can lead to speciation as well as expansion like human being, the migration, the three waves of the human migration out of Africa, isn't it? Then the vicarians is just opposite. Vicarians is that uh, there is actually, a, 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 you know, there is a, a big homogeneous population earlier, but then that got split because of the geographical barrier. Like this, uh, you know, this is a very large uh, population. Then because let us say these are mountains, then it diverged into, uh, you know, uh, two different species. So this is a, uh, allopatric speciation right so this particular middle population got extinct then uh, the, co the contact of these two started losing then uh, it diverged into two different populations so that is called vicarian so this kind of question vicarians and dispersal is one of the you know recurring theme in phylogeography papers if you read right some other uh, topics in the evolutionary biology includes genetic draft so like drift, the draft is like genetic hitchhiking, you know. So like in a road trip, you hitchhike with some other um, car, right, or a motorcycle, right. You are simply asking for lift. So the genes, some other genes are being selected, but uh, this gene is also getting, uh, you know, uh, selected along with the other gene because of the proximity, because of the linkage in the chromosome, physical proximity in, in the chromosome. These two genes are adjacent, let us say. So, and because of that, one gene is getting selected, the other also get automatically free rides, you know, like a lift in the, the hitchhiking, isn't it? That is called genetic draft. Then evolutionary medicine, medicine uh, also make use of the evolutionary theory a lot. For example, antibiotic resistance, you think of all these dialogues, uh, oftentimes recurring in the current, uh, you know, the uh, current affairs, for example, MRSA, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis that is uh, called MDRT, right? Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis or uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. All these are antibiotic resistance. So the evolution of antibiotic resistance is also like, um, we have already discussed this when we discussed about artificial selection, isn't it? So yes, so as the evolution in epidemics like ongoing COVID-19, you know, so new, new variants like the latest variant is Omicron, isn't it? And does it stop at Omicron with 32 mutations? No, new, new variants are going to come, right? Definitely. So in, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, usually two to three mutations are getting accumulated in its genome, you know, every month. So that is the mutation frequency, you know. So all these things are really interesting questions in epidemics and infectious diseases, you know. So that is why evolution is really important. And evolutionary psychology is another thing, our own thinking pattern and our own, uh, you know, our own behavior, human behavior. Uh, many of our human behaviors can be explained by 
uh, adaptation and the natural selection, the Darwin's theory, you know. So again, that is adaptationist paradigm, right? So through adaptationist lenses. So if you look through that, you will see that many of our uh, behavior can have uh, evolution explanation and many doesn't have. People are still working towards it. For example, a sexual orientation and promiscuity. Promiscuity means uh, having multiple sexual partners. So promiscuity is advantages, evolutionally, you know. And there is always there is a trade-offs, you know, advantage and disadvantage. But if the advantage is more than disadvantage, then such behaviors are selected, isn't it? So, but sexual orientation, for example, gay, you know, uh, gay or uh, uh, yes, lesbianism or all this uh, uh, LGBTQ, does it have any evolutionary advantage? Have you thought about it? You know, so that is. Again, that is uh, that all these are the questions in uh, evolutionary psychology, you know, sexual orientation. How about depression? Very common. Or even postpartum depression. So, that is a very common phenomenon, uh, you know, that is common in uh, mothers, you know, recent mothers. So, our post delivery, postpartum, uh, many of the mothers do face depression and they don't even care the babies. I'm talking about human beings. And why such behavior is selected in human society? If it is deleterious, obviously it is bad for the baby. And why then we have that kind of behavior? How about suicide? Very common, right? So why suicide is also very common in the human population? If it is obviously deleterious for the human population, right? And parental investment, right? How much are you investing on the betterment of the 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 offspring. All these are the questions uh, that comes oftentimes in evolutionary psychology. Okay, so yeah, so these are some of the topics that are quite common. Now we will see some other concepts about phenotype and environment, uh, which is commonly used in uh, evolution.